uh, last lecture, um, I had uh, presented kind of a, a vision um, and to a some degree a call to action involving systems data science. Um, uh, I had noted the uh, compatibility, but more than that, the synergistic nature of understanding in two rapidly advancing spheres of computational understanding. Um, uh, on the one hand, system science, um, and on the other, data science. Um, system science uh, is, is focused on helping us uh, understand, um, uh, manage, uh, anticipate, behaviors of dynamically complex systems. Um, and uh, it places a premium on understanding underlying drivers um, for uh, things we see in the world, understanding the, the processes that, that are operating in the world that give rise to the outcomes uh, that are important to us, whether it's um, new cases or hospitalizations or death or cases of, of uh, of depression or, or what have you, um, we seek to understand the underlying uh, uh, governing uh, factors which shape those, uh, in part because uh, we want to anticipate, um, in part because we want to explain, but in part because we want to examine counterfactuals. We want to say, how could we bend the curve, right? Um, how could we flatten it? How could we um, uh, imp uh, lower the burden of, of depression in uh, adolescence during the pandemic? How could we reduce the number of, uh, of ICU uh, patients uh, during the most acute phase of the Omicron outbreak? Um, so system science um, challenges us with, with understanding the underlying uh, factors that are governing things we see in the world. And while things we see in the world are, are kind of the tip of, uh, tip of the iceberg, system science is dealing with the iceberg that's beneath the surface as well, because that's what often ends up hitting the ship and, and potentially putting us in a bad way. Um, data science is this rather newer emerging science, um, which seeks to gain insight via analysis of empirical data using computational methods. Um, it's seeking to keep us honest by refreshing our understanding with new data as it comes in, often data that's uh, high volume, high velocity, high veracity, uh, and high variety. It matches the four Bs of, of big data. Data science is seeking to ensure that we're always learning from data and uh, that we can tease out hidden patterns within um, data we're dealing with. And what I presented last time was an argument that these two work can work together. Both of them are dealing with, with uh, behavior over time in many ways. They're often dealing with uh, rather articulated, finer grained depictions of, of situations. And uh, I argued that uh, from the perspective of, of kind of understanding patterns, they both bring a lot to the table. But they're both also highly complementary. Data science. I, I quoted uh, from epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman, um, that theory without data is myth. And system science without constant learning from empirical evidence can grow increasingly at variance with things in the world. It can grow uh, increasingly unrealistic and off base. Um, uh, because of the vagaries of stochastics, we can't anticipate when exactly that outbreak occurs. But when it occurs, we want to be right on top of it. And uh, system science needs a way of learning automatically. It, it needs a way of, of, of taking uh, data as it comes in and, and using it to inform the models. And in fact, in data science, we have these tools for taking data and understanding what is it whispering to us about the structure of the system? What is it telling us is what is driving what, for example? Um, and that can be extremely useful for shaping our system science models. It can keep us constantly regrounded. It can help us do theory building with these models, inform model structure and choices. Um, and in fact, uh, more quickly point out when our cherished uh, system science model or simulation model, being a compartmental model or an agent-based model or a hybrid model or you know, multi-scale model 
um, where exactly it's off base using fine grained data collected by the tools of data science. Meanwhile, system science, um, as Phil Zuckerman said, data without theory is madness. Data science needs an understanding of the underlying drivers, the theory, um, from what the statisticians sometimes call the data generating process, even though you know, the data is the tip of the iceberg often, and there's a lot more. It's kind of like talk about the food system as a cake generating process. But um, from a statistical perspective where we're dealing with data, of course, we're, we're concerned where it comes with. And if the data rate generating process changes the underlying drivers for the data we see, it's going to lead to change patterns in that data. Data science needs a way of of cluing into those changes, reasoning about those counterfactuals, um, and uh, being able to accommodate um, those sort of uh, uh, new, you know, the evolution of the of the underlying system. But data science also is traditionally focused a little bit too, um, too, and too fragmented away, um, too, um, in a in a fashion that treats different data sets often as solitudes, each rich and patterned, but um, doesn't really speak explicitly traditionally about, about their relationship to one another. Um, and often we find from system science, we know that an underlying system, when we get data about different aspects of the situation from that system, even though they might be in different data sets, you know, the hospital data on admissions, is in a separate uh, in, in hospital census. The count of people in the hospitals in a different data set than cases and tests, the count of tests being delivered. And maybe it's in a data, different data set for mortality numbers. They're, they're not independent. They're not solitudes. They're different faces of a common underlying situation. And system science tells us actually the data about any one of those whispers to us about the broader system. And actually, contains information about all the others. That's a bold statement, but we'll see it's grounded in rigorous mathematics. And in fact, in proofs that demonstrate uh, it for a wide variety of, of uh, coupled dynamic systems. Um, it doesn't actually require very strong assumptions uh, to, to demonstrate that. Uh, and so data science needs a way of waking up to the fact that you know all this disparate data which looks so different, it's in different data sets, is in fact different facets, different faces of an underlying situation that's, that's held in common. And system science can clue us into why we're seeing that data, why we're seeing the patterns, clue us into different patterns to look for that can identify causal signatures, for example, and identify ways of, um, uh, that that the data might be more reliable or identify blind spots with the data. So system science and data science are about moving beyond myth and madness, um, using data and theory together, theory captured by system science, data um, being analyzed by the tools of, of data science in a way that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That was the vision I presented, that the motivation, um, that the call to action. Let's now jump into some of the methods. Um, and to understand these, you have to understand we're dealing with rich areas. I, I kind of, I, I put together this diagram in my, so one of my roles at play in Canada is, is serving as the, uh, one of the co-leads on artificial intelligence for public health. And I put together this diagram, which illustrates in my mind, the relationship between many of the factors we're talking about here. System science overlapping with data science, but also and, and with machine learning here as a subcomponent of artificial intelligence, and you know getting into uh, to matters that that overlap with statistical learning theory, and in fact there should really be a lobe of it related to deep learning and Bayesian methods. Certainly, um, there there's some overlap. Um, these, these are uh, also not totally different fields. There's overlap between them. And in our work across the sphere of data science and machine learning, we cross over many of these boundaries very regularly. Often they're taught in different courses. The students trained in one, like machine learning, often never get into system science and never glimpse um, the, the significance of the overlap. That is what this course is about. So I noted, in our uh, first day uh, a week ago, 
that we're going to cover a lot of topics. And for most people in the course, these were probably a lot of names. But for your choices, for your projects, these are things that have import, right? Um, you want to know why in the world would I use this thing convergent cross mapping and how does that compare to using hidden Markov models or PMCMC? So a bunch of acronyms here. It's full of sound and fury and maybe doesn't really signify much to you um, at the current time. I'd like to give you a glimpse of what each of these involves. And for each of them, try to hint as to what project ideas might be. So let's talk about state space analysis. This is a sphere of analysis with, uh, with uh, models, be they compartmental or agent-based or what have you, that is underserved, I think, in a lot of teaching um, on system science. Um, you know, when we look at data coming from a model, the traditional lens we look at is the over time lens. We look at how it behaves over time. We, we have a plot and we see, you know, a, a curve for the number of susceptibles, the number of infectives and the number of recoveries or what have you. And that is an extraordinarily important and valuable and quite essential lens of system science. But there's another lens called um, uh, face-based diagrams or state-based diagrams where we have a depiction, say for a model like this, an SI, I call it T for temporarily immune, a TI. Um, we have a depiction of the behavior of that system where there's no time axis, rather we have S on one, so we have susceptibles on this axis, infectives on this axis, and the number of people in this state on this axis, the contemporarily kind of recovered state. And we see the evolution of the system over time here. Um, uh, we see it evolving in a way it starts with lots of susceptibles and you know you can't really see it but you can imagine this coming out of the screen at you as the susceptibles decrease and the number of infectives decrease and the number of temporarily immune people rise and then it spirals in um this same system has time behavior but it has a state space depiction and it turns out that this is an extraordinarily rich and powerful lens and people trained in dynamical systems and physics um, will often make use of this lens. So they'll show, for example, daily reported cases on the x-axis x -axis and daily reported deaths. Time here, as in here, is implicit, right? It's kind of, you can think of ball as rolling down this thing and where it is at any one point, uh, it will evolve down this, but there's no time axis. And so it is here, you see, you know, a health system going through a larger number of cases, which lead to larger number of cases, and then you see the deaths accumulate and it comes back. State space plots are very useful, um, uh, or, or they're often called phase space. This is another example where total confirmed cases, and this is new confirmed cases over the past seven days. Um, now it turns out that state space has structure to it, and Often it has different basins of attraction, and we'll be exploring how, you know, in a in a given system, we might have some trajectories which end up in one fixed point or stationary point or 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 equilibrium. But if we're just on the other side of this kind of boundary, we head off to a different one. Just a small difference. It's like a drop of water running down one side of the Rockies in Canada versus the other side. One side, it, it ends up in the Arctic Ocean. The other side, it ends up in the Pacific. State space is a very important tool. Now, the full significance of this will become clearer when we get to an understanding of embedding uh, later in this presentation. But you know, project ideas here is you can use a state space and phase space lens using data from different jurisdictions in varying measures. Um, to, to actually turn a, a unique eye on the sort of data that comes from the Canadian provinces or that comes from worldwide jurisdictions. Just as um, this article, for example, looked at it for a variety of, of countries, we could use a state space lens to understand um, uh, pandemic outcomes, hospitalizations, cases, deaths, uh, uh, number of tests. And you can get often some understanding of the dynamics, which really supplements what you have with time behavior. As I say, the, the, 
full opportunities here will only become clear when we go in and talk about embedding below, but that's down here in the CCM section. So the course will then talk about, and I've highlighted in black because it's not a new method, it's just a reminder. I wouldn't think it'll be fruitful for a focus of a project per se. It's kind of, you know, when we parameterize models, where do we get our data from? How do we get that? How do we put it into our models? Often there's a backing out process. And then we'll talk about a set of methods which provide us estimation methods for either parameters, the latent state of the system, or both. The parameter assumptions, like we, as alternatives to putting them in from estimates in the literature, or uh, from, from a process that deduces them automatically, like calibration or PMCMC, for example, or approximate patient computation. But many of these techniques estimate the latent state of the system, the underlying state of the system in addition to or as an alternative to parameters. So calibration will just review the basics. Um, basics, the idea is we try to have our model match empirical data along many lines of model outputs. We have empirical data, we compare model data that's comparable to it, to that empirical data, and we adjust our parameter assumptions. So we kind of triangulate from diverse data sources. And we typically use a global optimization algorithm to kind of go through parameter space. This is one parameter along that axis, another here, another along here. And we kind of walk through parameter space to find the best fit of the model. For each of these points in parameter space, we have the model producing results and we compare that to empirical data and we tune those parameters, we hone in on a, um, uh, on a set of parameter values that simultaneously best matches the empirical data. That's the basic idea with calibration. An old technique, uh, a uh, familiar technique perhaps to many of you, uh, an extremely widely used technique, ubiquitous really for, for many modelers. Um, and it requires specifying some information. We'll be going through that. Um, now, uh, when we um, talk about this, though, it, it brings us to opportunities for other methods like those here for estimating things like approximate Bayesian computation or MCMC, which fundamentally also focus on this issue of estimating parameters. Um, so, uh, you know, within these spheres, we, we want to look beyond um, just kind of point estimates for parameters. We're trying to understand not parameters, you know, a single number for them that gives that very best match of calibration, but a distribution for them reflecting our uncertainty that maybe we could interpret it. It could be as low as this. Maybe, you know, the, the reporting rate could be lower and the contact rate could be higher or vice versa. And it's really the combination of them that were, um, uh, that that determines it. And so we have a, a distribution, a joint distribution uh, about them, where um, it's not that there's a single best one, but there's a set of alternatives that are equally good. Um, so traditional parameter estimation, you know, has some real limitations. It gives a single point estimate traditionally. And even if you have some sort of covariance around there, it's often assuming this kind of unimodal assumption. It assumes you have one best peak um, of, of goodness, um, uh, et cetera. And it's all for a single dynamic model. Um, we're going to talk about alternatives for that. And what I really want to talk about first was approximate Bayesian computation. So approximate Bayesian computation is kind of the simplest Bayesian technique that we use with dynamic models um, with continuous state spaces. So where we have say compartments, number of people susceptible, infected and recovered. And it's basically a way of approximating a posterior distribution over parameters, which we will throughout this course label with theta. Theta is a vector of parameters. So maybe in theta we have beta and we have you know, mu, the mean time to recovery, and we have um, C, the, the contact rate. 
Uh, so we have a vector of parameters here, and we're trying to estimate in light of the observed data, which throughout this course we'll denote with y, um, you know, a posterior distribution. What, given, given that data from the world, given our model structure, what's, you know, what's the distribution over parameter values um, that's kind of implied by this? Um, certain parameter values are going to be cons consistent with the empirical data Y from the world. Others are going to be at variance with it. And we want a probability distribution that will summarize this. And this provides us a way of doing that without likelihoods. Um, parameters here are drawn from a, a prior distribution, but it's approximate Bayesian. So we're not using actually formal likelihoods. And we're in fact, we're trying to estimate this posterior distribution with sampling. And it's a very simple process where we, we kind of run the model with a given a set of parameters. We ask, hey, is this set of parameters good enough? Does it have a good enough fit? We have what's called the discrepancy function or error function, um, energy function, cost function. It goes by different names. And we ask, you know, hey, how good is the model fit? How, how disparate is it for the data? If it's below a certain threshold, we accept that as a sample, this data. Otherwise, we reject it. And we keep on trying different samples of data drawn from a, a prior distribution. Um, this is very, very valuable technique, very versatile. It can be used with ABMs, stochastic models, discrete event simulations, complex ODEs. Um, very value, valuable. It's very computationally tractable. It's performant. Uh, it has limited memory demand. Um, and we can even use it to sample from models. Um, there's implementations of it available in Python. Um, it's easy to code up in something like Julia uh, and has many advantages. Um, it does have some disadvantages. We're not sampling from the latent state of the model. We're not dealing with the fact that there's stochastics and, oh, now we know it went this way. And so from now on, we'll count on that. We're just optimizing parameter values. Um, now, ABC though is, is very versatile. It can be applied with empirical data and ABM, or you could apply for a compartmental model uh, with, with ABC. You could use ABC approximate Bayesian computation with particle filtering and compare what, what sort of answers do they get? Particle filtering is stronger. It's a much stronger method. It estimates the latent state, but it doesn't allow us directly to estimate parameter values, except that they evolve. Um, you could compare it ABC directly with PMCMC would be another thing with a compartmental model. And you know we could evaluate how ABC does using synthetic data that we've generated. We know the true situation and we evaluate how well ABC allows us to estimate the real value of the parameters that were used um, to generate that data, identify its blind spots and vulnerabilities. So those are some ideas for the proximate Bayesian computation. Um, uh, questions on these things again. I think we'll, we'll um, you know, discussing possible matches to project ideas. We can we can hit on those in the uh, office hours. Let's talk about hidden Markov models. Another topic discussed. This has a simpler depiction, uh, a, a depiction of a simpler system, a system that's in one of a set of discrete states. You could think of them as categorical states. Um, there is an outbreak, or there's no, you know, a foodborne illness outbreak, or not. Um, or um, there's a lockdown or none, or you know, someone um, is uh, ill with um, symptomatically infected with COVID or not, and you're trying to judge uh, based on data from their smartphones, or they are you know, uh, quarantining or not. Um, so here we have a transition that uh, a system that transitions between these discrete states. We don't have continuous states like number of in, of, of susceptible people, we have it's the status of the system as one of these couple possibilities, and we have one or more types of observations over time, each of which is ambiguous. It's noisy, perhaps sparse, um, subject to ambiguity, and um, and we're trying to infer what's the underlying state of the system. This is kind of the the grandma of all the these methods down here uh, beneath it, like uh, Kalman filtering, MCMC, particle filtering, particle MCMC, they all draw from the basic intuitions here. We're trying to infer what's the hidden state of the system. 
what's the latent state, the state we can't observe? Um, and using HMMs, we ask these questions, you know, what are the, at any one time, what state am I in? Um, or what state, what state trajectory, what sequence of states have I been in till, you know, to get to this point? How did I end up getting here to this state? What are the set of latent states? What are the transition probabilities between these states? What's the transition probability will be in a foodborne illness uh, outbreak, you know, um, over the course of uh, uh, the next year, judging from data from the past 20 years about the reports of symptomatic illness consistent with foodborne, um, uh, foodborne illness. So, um, you know, here we're often interested in understanding the underlying situation or the parameters that give, uh, that drive the process. So we're going back and forth between states and we're trying to estimate P or trying to, you know, these probabilities of transition, or we're trying to estimate at any one time, for example, are we in an outbreak state or not? Um, so we've used HMMs uh, with uh, empirical time series. It can be extremely valuable at an individual level to ask if someone might be depressed based on tweeting behavior or based on smartphone data. Uh, or to, to look at HMMs for, um, for outbreaks, um, to have early outbreak detection, for example. Um, uh, we can also apply more sophisticated sampling techniques like MCMC to HMM inference. Typically it's done in a maximum likelihood way that we'll be discussing, but you can actually do much more sophisticated um, analysis with it. Uh, and, you know, we could, for a project, another idea would be to test and evaluate HMMs, again, using synthetic data to discover when are they on base, when are they off base, or, you know, when, under what conditions they yield reliable results, and when are they not so reliable. Okay, just going through the methods here, another method for, um, for uh, estimation, like approximate Bayesian computation, is based on the desire to char characterize a distribution for the parameters in light of the empirical data. Here I've written with a subscript for time. Um, and where we, again, like with ABC, approximate Bayesian computation, we sample from possible values of theta. Here, uh, we're, we're trying to sample from, we're trying to approximate at some level, trying to estimate what is this posterior distribution? With approximate Bayesian computation, we forewent, we, we didn't have likelihood functions. Here we're making use of likelihoods. It's a level up in terms of rigor. And typically those likelihoods with the dynamic model will be formulated to compare dynamic model outcomes given it, that it has run with a set of parameters with, um, uh, with empirical data. And the basic idea is we have a likelihood function and we have a prior distribution on theta and likelihood function. And so we, when we get a, a candidate value, we can evaluate its posterior value. We're trying to sample from it. We're trying to understand what this distribution is. You know, where is it really high posterior density region? Where is it really likely the parameter values are? we can't just kind of figure out the shape of that. We have to sample from it. And so we get a candidate value by randomly picking something near us. Um, we're at any one time, we're at a point in space and parameter space, theta. This is supposed to be a little, a little arrow over it. It got, it looks like it lost its arrowhead. And, and at any one time, we, we have kind of a current position. We perturb it. We disturb it a little bit. So we're off in a little bit of a different direction from that. We calculate the posterior at that candidate and we compare it to where we currently are. And hey, if that candidate is even better posterior, we definitely go there. If it's only half as good as us, we go there with a probability of 0.5. And, and that leads us to jump over there if we go there. And we're just kind of jumping around with this random walk and we spend more time on areas that are more likely where the posterior is high. If everything around us is really lousy compared to our current situation, we won't tend to transition much. We'll just stay where we are and keep on repeating. We'll just keep on reporting 
emitting our current position as the as the sorry the current position as the um, as the one where we're staying. If on the other hand we transition, we'll we'll have a new estimate uh, for theta, and this is a way of sampling from values of theta. So if we have a distribution, which I've shown in one dimension here, um, this might be one parameter. In general, I have many parameters. Um, at any one time, you're at a certain place, you consider a candidate value. Hey, that looks good. We'll go there. And then you start emitting that. Um, but you're at the king of the hill here. And so your chance, if, if you look at candidates you know, that are down here, you're not going to go there much, and you'll keep on uh, emitting these ones. Um, so you'll tend to spend more time in the places that are high here and less time where it's low. In short, you will sample from this distribution without being able to draw it out directly, you'll be able to sample from it. Um, and in general, with a nonlinear model, we can't draw out a priori without simulating the model what this distribution is. We have to sample from it. So for each of these values of theta, we run the model, we produce results that say like over time, how many, um, gosh, I should have a picture of it here. How many, uh, it got separated from it. How many infected people are there? And we compare it to the empirical number. We compute a likelihood function and say, ah, uh, that's not, it's very unlikely we would have that number. Uh, we would think there'd be this number of reported people and there's actually that number. So the likelihood would be low there. So for each of these values of theta, we're computing a likelihood, multiplying it by the prior um, and, and basically arriving at an estimate for the posterior and using that to figure out whether we transition or not. Um, project ideas here. Well, you can apply P MCMC with empirical data and a compartmental model. It's great. And, and you can get out not point estimates for every parameter of, a, of the compartmental model, but a, a distribution, a joint distribution over these. It may say when C is high, beta tends to be low, and beta is high, C is low. But you know, you can kind of pick either one of those as a reasonable explanation of the empirical data. For example, um, we could we could, for example, compare parameter estimates for MCMC versus what we get out of calibration for a compartmental model. That would be an interesting exercise. Maybe we compare MCMC with what we get from ABC. Right? You know, I can modify this and make it from, you know, compare it to ABC, approximate Bayesian computation. Um, uh, and, you know, we could, we could again test it with empirical data where we know the true situation and see where is MCMC on the money and where is it off base? Where is it fall short in its accuracy? MCMC is a great approach for more rigorously sampling from possible parameter values. It, it is like that, like approximate Bayesian computation, both their sampling methods, both allow us to, um, uh, to estimate the distribution through sampling of parameters of our compartmental model. Great. Um, so these parameters, which where we don't have direct data to put them in with parameter estimation, we leverage all this data we have about outcomes on cases and hospital admissions and deaths. And we, we weave that straw into golds in the form of these parameter estimates. And uh, MCMC provides an extra level of rigor, of Bayesian rigor that moves it from approximate Bayesian computation to real Bayesian computation. Great. Let's go on to Kalman filtering. This is another form of Bayesian technique, another Bayesian technique. It dates back to the 1960s or late 50s. I think Kalman may have been working on it. And it captures an essential idea. I drew this slide from my, my student, Winchell Chen, who's published on, on using Kalman filtering, amongst other things, with data collected from smartphones to correct epidemiological data epidemiological models of infection spread. Great. Um, so here, what we do is we have a model, and that, this is actually true for PMCMC and MCMC, or and particle filtering too. The basic idea here is common filtering, like these techniques, provides a way of estimating the true state of the system and correcting our understanding of that true state. 
so it's not just we're we're estimating parameter values. We're we're actually estimating you know the the number of people infected at this given time, and we're not just taking the model as the ground truth. We're not taking it its word for it. We're using the empirical evidence from the world to cross check what the model thinks. We have a certain amount of confidence in the model, but we have a certain amount of confidence in the data, and we're weighing the two of them. So we're taking measurements in the world, we're taking model projections, and we are, we are using the two of them to cross check each other and arriving at kind of a consensus estimate. And this consensus estimate is a savvy consensus estimate. It takes into account that the longer it's been since we have made an observation, for example, the more and more uncertain we are about the true model state. Um, because who knows what stochastics might have happened in that time that the model can't possibly be expected to, to anticipate. And so the more we go on, the less certain we are of model results. And when we see a new piece of data after a long period of no, no information to ground the model, we're inclined to take that very seriously. On the other hand, if we just see another measurement the next day after correcting the model with the last one, and that measurement is off, we might be inclined to chalk it up to measurement error, to noise in the process. So we have a realistic system. We have a state transition model that has some um, uh, uncertainties associated with it. And we have some measurements that have noise and we blend the two. And there's a common filter, which we use as a technical construct to do this. Um, it's um, the underlying simulation model includes stochastic processes. Um, it, it involves uh, a growing degree of uncertainty, therefore, as time goes on. Um, as uh, you know, uh, it evolves, we, we don't know exactly when the outbreak will occur, right? And you know, part of some of the stochastic realizations think, oh, the outbreak already happened. And some think, oh, it's yet to happen. And we can't expect a, a model as good as it is to exactly predict when a chance event will happen. So we have these stochastics to represent that. And what happens is that over time, as new data comes in, it will correct our understanding of the state of the system with the simulation model. Um, and it does so using maximum likelihood uh, approach, which we'll talk about when we, when we deal with this method. But it's a, it's a very common approach used um, statistically when we're working with uh, dynamical systems of this sort. Um, so uh, there's a, a formal um, derivation um, of the Kalman filter um, due to uh, Rudolf Kalman uh, in the 1960s or late 50s. Um, but that was proven optimal for linear systems. And of course, in in uh, communicable disease transmission, we have non-linear systems. We have the S times the I, right? It, it takes two to tango. Um, in order to infect a person, you need a susceptible, but you also need an infective. If there's no susceptibles, you're not gonna get an infection. If you're no infectives, you're not gonna get an infection. You need both. And it's non-linear because you need, the, you need both. And, and for non-linear systems, uh, this is not provably optimal. But we can get pretty good by, uh, in many cases, by linearizing it around the current point in state space. Now, um, some of the most perceptive of you may, may recognize, well, how do we know where we are in state space? Well, we're trying to judge where we are in state space. And so we are trying to track where we are, what's the current state of the system over time, linearizing around that state to figure out how much to weigh this evidence from the world, how much to weigh this evidence from the model. And we are then weighing the two um, according to the noise and the measurements and how uncertain we are about our position and using that to kind of trust one more than the other. This is the type of system that airplanes and unfortunately, uh, and, and rockets and unfortunately missiles depend on to keep them accurate. And it may run many times a second, for example, where it corrects these, uh, these estimates of the system. And we'll go through these equations together. Um, 
you notice there's uh, a Jacobian here um, matrix. There's actually two Jacobians, one with respect to measurements and one with respect to system evolution, the, the, the equations governing system evolution. And they are evaluated at the current uh, position in state space as estimated. This does require a, a, a system that can be differentiated uh, in a compartmental model is typically what we use. The challenge of it is that often you're in a system which for infectious disease where you have multiple basins of attraction. And if you are off in your understanding of where you are in the system, you may think you're in one place and you linearize around that where you're really in the other you're going to be in a bad way. You're just going to be so confused. Um, it's like wandering around with your eyes closed in the dark, and you know you're trying to figure out where you are, and you're you're in the wrong room, <laughs> and and so you end up going the wrong way, right? Um, uh, but Coleman filtering is a tried and true technique. It's in all of our smartphones with, um, you know, using GPS signals, for example. Um, uh, and it's highly efficient. Uh, we can apply it uh, with empirical data in a model very quickly. And you know, project ideas would be, hey, try it out with an empirical data and a compartmental model, linearize the compartmental model in closed form and, and figure this out. And, and you can define very readily a common filter and you could do it with an age stratified model, et cetera. Um, uh, you could compare the state estimates from a common filter versus the next sophistic more sophisticated technique, which is known as particle filtering, which I'll introduce in just a minute here, um, watching the time here. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we could compare the two and see how they do. Common filter is meant as much, much, much orders of magnitude cheaper, but it also makes some pretty strong assumptions, linearizability, you're not going to do that for a model which can't be linearized. Um, it's non-analytic. Um, but it also makes a very strong assumption that the noise in the system, process noise, so how much the system evolution is, is noisy, that that and the noise to the measurements follow Gaussian distributions, follow normal distributions. And that often for epi models is a pretty strong assumption. And if you it's a pretty restrictive assumption. If you have a number of cases that are between zero and five and you're assuming the number is normally distributed, it would suggest there's negative number of cases. So that can be a problem. Um, and um, it's one of the reasons why particle filtering um, can be liber liberating for certain types of problems. But another thing we could do is you know, test out common filtering uh, I mean, it's it's one thing to say, oh, this probably doesn't do well for that case, but we could test it, right? We could have an ABM, an individual-based model with stochastics, generating data, small counts of cases and so on, and see how well a common filter does on it. We know the true situation. We can see how far off the common filter's estimate of the underlying state, that's what this thing is, X, um, how far its estimate is off from the real situation that we know obtained, that, that in fact um, was, was in place when we generated the data for it. So we feed it data of the sort you'd have empirically from the real world with noise and with um, you know, incomplete reporting and blah, blah, blah. And you, you see you know, what things trip it up, what, under what situations it's very reliable, under what things it's very vulnerable. It, 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 you know, when does it have blind spots? When is it totally out to lunch? Um, maybe it depends on how frequently you get data, whether you're getting it every day or every week, um, uh, et cetera. And these are the sort of things you could do in a synthetic data experiment, generating data as you see fit, you know, with six hour times between reporting versus 12 hour versus 24 hour versus 48 hour versus 96 hour and test out its, its reliability. Um, okay, um, obviously we'll go into those things a lot more detail. We'll tease out what does this mean? And for those who are not familiar with matrix mathematics, for whom your heart, for those for whom the heart doesn't leap when you see matrices, I will help you parse this out and understand what at an intuitive, intuitive level, what those matrices mean, because matrices um, have intuition associated with it. And there's beautiful intuition that we'll tease out associated with the common filter. We'll find 
this, for example, gain matrix, it's a, it has a world of sense of how it balances between the measurements, um, trusting the measurements versus trusting the, the model itself. Let's go on to particle filtering. Particle filtering, like common filtering, is set up in the situation where, look, we have a lot of data that we have historically. Um, for our modeling, we have wastewater data, cases, um, persons tested, uh, deaths, uh, hospitalization, ICU admissions and census, hospital admissions and census. Um, and uh, we want to take all that data to this current point, not just the latest estimates, but the, the, the earlier data, because data is noisy. Um, we want to take that all and estimate the current situation of the system, the, the state of the system. This should remind you of the particle filter of, of the common filter. That's what we we're doing. We we're trying to estimate the state of the system. But here we were estimating a maximum likelihood estimate. We kind of put our eggs in the basket of this. And when we had a um, uh, what's called a covariance distribution around that, um, a covariance estimate around that. But you know, that's kind of assuming it's unimodal. It's it's assuming that it's it, it, we have this covariance matrix that's, that is implying a certain amount of symmetry. Here, we're instead, with particle filtering, going to estimate the full joint distribution over the state of the model. And we can use that then to project forward, to ask what if questions, to anticipate what's coming. So, uh, and, you know, MCMC previously, we were estimating um, parameters. That was a full Bayesian technique. This, too, can be a full Bayesian technique where we're estimating not parameters, but the latent state of the system, the underlying true state of the system. How many susceptibles are there? How many infectives are there? How many recoveds? How many undiagnosed people? How many people who are you know, uh, uh, asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic? For a set of parameters in the given model in light of the data. Um, so here we're trying to sample from this joint distribution over state. Like the common filter, this is performed recursively. A new data point comes in. We just update our existing estimate, our, our weights for our particles. Um, uh, we're simulating like the common filter with a stochastic underlying system. But here we have much greater flexibility. We're not counting on normally distributed stochastics. None of that. We're not counting on, on you know, the measurements being Gaussian distributed. We don't have to make any of those assumptions. This is a very general technique. Um, and the simulation model, um, between, predict between observations, it just runs um, in a normal way. But it runs for a set of different particles. So it's kind of like with particle filtering, we are considering across the entire model, um, it's simultaneously for a variety of, of jostling hypotheses, each trying to explain the data we're seeing as best it can. So each of these hypotheses has a different state it posits as obtaining right now in the system. There might be a particle that thinks, I think there's lots of susceptibles and just a few infectives, just a few exposed and almost no recovered. So in other words, it says you're out to lunch. There's actually a lot of infectives, a smaller number of susceptibles than you thought, quite a lot of exposed and a moderate number of recovered. And each of these is jostling to explain the data. Each contains a complete hypothesis about the state, a complete state vector that it believes is the case. They're representing these competing hypotheses, and yet we don't treat those all as equal. Um, they're lent different levels of credence, of credibility, of believability. Specifically, we associate a weight. If, if a particle is a, the sample has a weight, we call it a particle, has a weight of two, it means it has it's represented twice as much in the distribution as the weight of one. And the trick here is with common filtering, we actually updated what our estimate was of the system. Um, when we see new data, we update, oh, I thought it was that, now I think it's this. I update my thinking. For particle filtering, we're not updating 
what any particle thinks. It's just particles believe hard. They don't change their mind. It's just we discount the ones that are off base and we play up the ones that are consistent with the evidence. So we adjust their weights to make them more, more prominent. And there's the survival of the fittest with them jousting. So maybe we have a state space model that looks kind of like this, where we have exposed, infected, recovered, and susceptibles for adults and for children, and we have evolution amongst them. This is actually from RTH Xiao Yan Li's work as her master's degree. She's gone on and done quite a lot more sophisticated things, but this is a contact matrix involving them. And we're estimating the state of the system and the time evolution for some of these elements of the contact matrix. And you know, with a traditional calibrated model, you might see something like this. You try to best match it to, to this data, a calibrate model with calibration, and, and you get something that's quite hopeless. Whereas you try it with a particle filter and you can always get it to follow the data very precisely. So the model's always being regrounded in the latest data and it says, oh, Oh, the outbreak occurred early. Okay, fine. I'm on it. I'm I'm gonna, you know, I'm I'll follow its evolution here, and and it will be understanding that now there's more people infected. So its expectation for the next little bit is that more infections will follow. And so what happens with particle filtering is it follows the data very very carefully. Um, it's listening to the model, but it's also listening to the data. And it recognizes there's a lot of stochastics the model can't uh, anticipate. And so it uses the clues from the world to, to clue us in. This is from the um, um, reported uh, cases for adults and for children from Chayenne's thesis. And the intriguing thing here is a model which does this is always kept abreast of the latest evidence. It's always learned from the latest evidence, the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations or what have you. And so, um, and yet it's simulating the system. And so, for example, if there's very few cases which have occurred recently, it, it just knows there's probably an outbreak brewing, right? And there's, there's a lot of susceptibles that have built up. It knows that it, those particles, most of them are saying there's lots of susceptibles here. It's, it's combustible, you know, all it takes is a spark and it will, it will explode. And so they're anticipating a likely outbreak. And lo and behold, there is one, or right here, there is one. Um, so it is being clued in what's actually happened and uses that to look forward. Same thing here, you know, it knows we may be at the peak here, but it, just as the sun that rises always sets, so it is that this is going to decline and it's probably gonna be kept pretty low for the next little bit after that. And then after that, we're not quite sure what's going to happen. So project ideas here, you can apply particle filtering with empirical data in a compartmental model. Um, we can provide you with a template for this in any logic. Um, you can also pursue it with other platforms uh, such as Julia and, and uh, I think uh, R or Mathematica as well. Uh, you can compare state estimates uh, from Coleman filtering versus particle filtering. Um, you could uh, evaluate them using synthetic data. And you know, if you, those who are really ambitious might try particle filtering with an ABM. Um, common filtering required us to have a model that could be linearized. You may, may re recall that. We had to linearize this model, take its Jacobian matrix, right? Um, by contrast, uh, with particle filter, we don't require that at all. So in principle, you could do it with an ABM. Um, our, our results thus far have been mixed, but you might be um, the first person who could demon, you know, could get um, get ignition with that in a really, really good way. We haven't explored it very deeply. Okay, um, I'm watching the time here, and uh, I'm going to go very quick through the next little bit. Particle MCMC, PMCMC, is a technique which takes the best of MCMC and particle filtering, combines them together. It has particle filtering as part of it, it has MCMC as part of it. Um, it samples jointly from parameters and from the latent state of the system. So for a given parameter, you know, best guesses, or a given, a given possible parameter value, it has a distribution over 
over the latent state, the number of people who are susceptible, the number of people who are infected, a joint distribution over all of those in light of the data. Um, this is a very computationally expensive process. Uh, we have code bases um, which um, are tuned in, in, uh, in C in order to offer good performance. And we've used it with GPUs, with graphical processing units to really speed it up. Um, uh, my student, Luce Duan, has, you know, has had dozens to over 100 times speed up possible because of the parallelism. But it is a very expensive uh, technique. Fundamentally, we're doing an MCMC sampling. And for each of them, we're doing a particle filtering. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into this, especially given that I want to get to a few more uh, items. But the basic idea is you do a particle filtering for each candidate value uh, of the parameters um, in MCMC. You use that to figure out the posterior value, and you either accept or reject that candidate. But you're sampling from trajectories. And you can do this with particle filtering as well from what the, what the evolution of the system was over time, not just cross-sectionally at the current situation, how many people are susceptible, infected, recovered, blah, blah, blah. But over time, what was the entire trajectory um, uh, for uh, a given latent sample? What does it think happened? What was the story it's telling versus the story this other one is telling? A particle is associated with a lineage, a history. It has a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent, each of which has a story to tell going further and further back in time. So it can give you actually trajectories over time. And this allows you to do something called backcasting, which is say, based on data we've seen since then, what was really going on back in the earliest days of the pandemic? How many uninfected, how many undiagnosed people were there secretly? Or what was going on this far this fall in terms of the immunology that gave rise to the Omicron uh, outbreak that we're seeing in Quebec, for example? So project ideas here, well, um, these are kind of of a cloth with what we've talked about before, very similar. Apply PMCMC to empirical data and compartmental model. Uh, we can work with you with our, with our code base, if you'd like. Um, or you could use something like uh, Mathematica for it. Um, and there might be an implementation now for Julia as well. You can compare parameter estimates from PMCMC and calibration. Um, you could compare state estimates from PMCMC versus common filtering versus particle filtering. You could test it and again, find blind spots. And um, uh, you could, uh, no, I wouldn't recommend using it with an ABM. This is a typo here. Um, uh, it's, it's too expensive. Um, okay, um, big data, um, uh, big data in health. Um, uh, there's many uh, rich data sources available that can shed light on health, health attitudes, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, but behaviors. Um, and some of them have been increasingly tapped during the pandemic. I'd include here data from smartphones, um, ourselves, as well as some folks at PHAC, have done data with social media. Um, and uh, data from wastewater has had, over many months, it's been part of uh, a regular reporting for ourselves to the health system as well. Um, uh, we can also use data from, um, uh, from search, searches. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned before, big data is characterized by the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. Um, and velocity is often the most important attribute here. It keeps our models honest on an ongoing basis. Google Trend Search can give you three-hour increments for small periods of time. You could look at, you know, changes over time and things like Lyme disease with rashes, um, or people searching for flu-related symptoms. This was during the pandemic, the H1N1 pandemic, for example. Um, uh, alternatively, we can use social media data, things like Twitter, and you'll find a certain degree of covariation between Twitter discourse on topics overall on COVID-19 related factors and number of cases. If you start burrowing down into people talk about symptoms or someone they knew is sick, you'd probably get a far better correlation. And we've got some machine learning work going on 
um, led by my student Yuan Tian to, uh, to try to do exactly that, building on success she's had with flu, doing it very successfully to recognize Twitter-related complaints of flu symptoms, which can be used for anticipating uh, flu evolution. And what we found is, I mean, not to be a spoiler, but what we found is with, uh, if we use data like from Google search together with um, a particle filter model, which also has access to clinical data, this is the thing. Um, you can, using clinical data, you could have a particle filtered H1N1 transmission model that is kept regrounded and it does okay. It's a lot better than using an unassisted model, a model just, up front, you run it and anticipate what to see. If it's regrounded by observations of cases, say every week, it's a lot better in its expectations or every day, much better. But if you combine it with social media data or search data, I should say, it's much more accurate yet. To anticipate cases, search data is less high quality, but it adds different information. And if you have a model set up to exploit that, it can enhance your ability to, to, uh, to anticipate clinical cases, even though it is lower quality data. Um, we also have a smartphone platform that some of you may know, the Ethica platform, Ethica Data, um, which is set up to allow really easy study deployments um, and you, you push surveys out to people, but it can also collect data sources that are sensor-based. Uh, these can include things like you know, pedometers and calories and, and phone use via um, screen time and so on, but also GPS. And it can also include with, um, uh, with modern sensors or in previous times, just with the phones before Google and, and uh, Apple cracked down on, on rules for this for apps, um, study participants, consenting study participants were allowed to opt into situations where phones could see each other with Bluetooth. So we could you know, pick up contact information on people, look at evolution of contacts over time uh, within networks of individuals, for example, and, and look at people's travel patterns uh, over areas. And we have quite a lot of data of that sort. Some of our work has combined this with, um, with modeling. A lot of our work has actually. And what we basically find, I'm gonna to cut to the chase so I can get onto CCM, is that, um, that there are certain types of, of, of communicable diseases and certain types of networks where if you don't have micro contact data, data that's you know, sensed uh, a lot more frequently than once a day, um, you can be really far off base in your estimate um, from what you would get with a fully detailed simulation access to, to very detailed contact pattern data. Um, if you know about this evolution of people's contacts, it really makes a difference in terms of outcomes a lot of the time. Um, it can make, you know, if you're sampling every three hours people's contact patterns versus every five minutes for certain types of fast moving conditions like Norwalk virus, it can make a very big difference. Omicron would probably be sim similar. So um, when it comes to smartphone data, the, the data on contact patterns or mobility patterns is often not merely a, a luxury, it's a necessity for certain types of outcomes to be reliable within a, within a close range. Um, so you, know, you could look at how availability of big data affects accuracy of simulation model results. Um, you could have work that would turn Twitter feeds into estimates of, um, you know, occurrences of, of uh, you know, RSV virus or uh, occurrences of uh, a flu in French and, and uh, use that to arrive at time series and feed it into a model. Um, and you could explore how availability of this big data affects the accuracy of some of these approaches that bring together time series with models, with transmission models. Um, uh, these ones like common filtering, approximate Bayesian computation or particle filtering. Just finishing up here and, and we're, we're kind of over the time I like to use to finish up. I'll just take a couple more minutes. This is probably, yeah, this is the last big topic I'll, I'll mention. Um, the last substantive topic, uh, which I'll, I'll try to do today. 
convergent cross mapping. So the idea here is incredibly powerful. Um, and it goes back to my opening remarks on state space. Um, I'd remind people when we're dealing with communicable disease models, invariably we are dealing with models that are tangled together and coupled. Um, the number of infectives matters for the, behavior, you know, the outcomes for susceptibles. What's going on in the compartment for infectives affects where, you know, how quickly those susceptibles become infected, right? Um, uh, if there's loss of immunity from recovered state, it's gonna affect susceptibles and soon enough infectives. So the evolution of state variables depends on the others. And it turns out this has huge consequences for data science because the evolution of one variable is entangled with that and the other. And what it's saying is information about one will whisper to you, will hint to you, about the others. Um, information about one, if you look close enough at it, you know something about the others, just as you know, if you were talking about a system of um, hares and lynx, uh, lynx hunt hares and, and hares are hunted by lynx. Um, if there are tons and tons of, of, of hares around, it probably tells you that uh, there's not many lynx around right now. Um, if there's very, very few hairs, there's probably recently been a lot of lengths to, to keep them suppressed. Um, telling about one will tell about the other, or knowing about one will tell about the other. And Floris Takens, the Dutch mathematician in the 1980s, proved under a wide variety of cases, you can actually reconstruct a dynamic system using information about just, for example, one, observa one type of observation. Um, this is a predator-prey model for those who don't recognize it. But uh, you know, if we solve, it turns out it, you can solve for the number of links in terms of the number of hairs and changes in the number of hairs. Sorry, the, the dot should be over the X, got displaced and, and vice versa. And so one is whispering to you about the other. And for those not familiar with it, like with the Lorenz attractor as a complex system, if you look at any one of these, um, uh, it turns out that you can reconstruct the others. If This doesn't look like it has a uh, hidden order, but it does. And you can extract from it using this technique known as state space embedding, the patterns for the other. Any one of these will tell you about the others because they're so coupled. And in empirical data, this is true. This is data from some experiments we collected with smartphone data, you know, and, and showing a reconstruction of, of an underlying system here, or more of that. The basic trick here is something called delay embedding. You take an observation of a certain sort, maybe it's cases, and you take create vectors of it and it as it was say seven days ago and 14 days ago. So tau is, is seven here. So as it currently is seven days ago, 14 days ago, 56 days ago, et cetera. And it turns out that if you um, create a space of these vectors that you will, um, have an evolution in that space that reconstructs the original system. Um, using just data from one thing, from one observation, cases, you can reconstruct what's driving the broader system. Um, and um, from this, uh, this technique known as uh, convergent cross mapping basically allows us to um, determine our, is, is one variable causally affecting another, or is it just uh, that they're disconnected, or is it that X is driving Y, or is it that there's a third factor driving both of them? It turns out that we can, through these techniques of state space embedding and, and through this technique known as convergent cross mapping, we can assess causality. But we can also just reconstruct uh, phenomena in the world and, and systems. So we can look at, going back to this opening slides, we can reconstruct the state space of an underlying system using just data from a single observate type of observation. These are from two different types, but we can do it actually with a single one by looking at what's called the delay embedding. So on one axis, you might have number of cases now and the other cases seven days ago or what have you. Okay, um, so, um, uh, I think I'll leave it there. I was going to say something about causal machine learning and deep learning, but um, 
I think we'll leave that uh, to a different time. Um, so project ideas, I've spoken about a number of ideas with synthetic ground truth testing of these techniques. I've talked about projects which involve applying these techniques, Kalman filtering or approximate Bayesian computation or particle filtering or particle MCMC to application areas, rich air areas there. You could apply CCM to identify causal signatures. Uh, you could apply state space reconstruction from one or just a few observation types to try to reconstruct the state space of the underlying driving system. Um, you can compare effectiveness of methods, particle filtering versus um, particle MCMC or ABC versus uh, MCMC or what have you. You could look at how much does um, having big data improve the ability for models to project forward in ways that are consistent with new observations, not take into account in building that model. Um, and you can do that with, uh, with things like particle filtering as well. See how much it improves the ability of the model to project, anticipate what's coming up in the next two weeks. Um, we could look at how system structure impacts what's called intrinsic dimensionality. I didn't have time to discuss that, but it's related to state space reconstruction. Um, and you know, we could look at the impact of noise or missing data on method effectiveness. Um, uh, and you know, possibly extending these techniques with individual based models. So those are all that I have time to uh, discuss today. I wanna express my appreciation for your uh, patience as I went through that and for so many of you hanging on here. Um, obviously, I would have loved to have opened it up for discussion during you know, this lecture time, but uh, I will be glad to talk about it during the, um, uh, you know, during this, uh, this office hours, which is coming up. And there's a question, can we say the uncertainty of common filtering is restricted to a Gaussian distribution? Um, that's certainly true for measurements and for process noise. Um, in the context of a nonlinear system, which is being, we don't say Kalman filter, but extended Kalman filter to be accurate um, because it's the linearized version. Um, you, you may see for state a, um, a, a non-Gaussian distribution around any point. I, I think it's fair to say, because you could have you could have uh, asymmetries, for example, in that. But it's, it's more that the things that, that govern the evolution of that state and the measurements have to be normally distributed to get the Kalman filter formalism to pop out. That is, is what you, that is, that has to be normally distributed for the Kalman filter, yeah. Um, but not, I don't think it would be accurate to say that the resulting state estimate for the system will always be Gaussian distributed. It, it may be actually a, a neuron is firing that leads me to think maybe it, maybe it is. So I, I guess I'd have to go off and, and muse about that and think about it and reconstruct my thinking. It, it, that actually may be the case now that I think, I, at one point I think I derived it and it, it may actually be the case that, but yeah, I, I can't comment on that with sureness right now, apologies. It, it could be. Okay. Um, apologies for going over, uh, your time is valuable and uh, I appreciate the extra time you put in. Um, I threw out a bunch of ideas for projects. Um, I will, the slides are posted, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I will be glad to discuss those projects with you either during office hours or uh, you know, in, in future sessions. And we'll try to have another Another session for project brainstorming next week, if possible. Um, ideally one I could attend, okay? So I'm gonna take a uh, health break for five minutes and I'll be back and we can talk further for office hours. Thank you very much. <laughs>